Black Fawn Distros Take Over Tuesday, the official podcast of Black Fawn Distribution. Broadcasting live across the planet and retransmitted on all major streaming platforms. Tonight's program is brought to you in part by Wellington Breweries, Hellas Lager, Deadly Grounds Coffee, Twisted Teas, and of course Canada's number one genre film company, Black Fawn Distribution. You wanted the best. Well, they didn't make it, so here's what you get. It's really not that bad. You are going to get on. Here's your host, Benner from Black Fawn Distro. All right, everyone, and welcome back to the program. I'm your host, Benner from Black Fawn Distro, and uh, let's just take this graphic off here. There I am. How's everyone doing tonight? Welcome back to another episode. Uh, we've got a great program uh, for you tonight. Uh, uh, of course, we are broadcasting live to Facebook, Twitch, Twitter, and YouTube, and of course, retransmitting on all the major streaming platforms, including Apple and Spotify. So please remember to like, follow, share, and subscribe on whatever platform you're listening in on or uh, tuning into. Uh, it'd be great, and we'd appreciate the support, of course. It uh, helps us out, but also helps out our guests and the really cool projects that they have coming up that they're working on. So uh, it helps everyone out. So if you feel like going the extra mile, uh, please feel free to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Um, that helps us get, get gets the show out to um, a whole bunch of other people and hopefully can reach a lot more film, a lot of a lot of. Uh, a lot more film fans and horror fans across the planet. Um, and uh, that that actually does help. So like I said, if you got some extra time in your hands and you want to leave, uh, leave a review on Apple Podcasts for the show, Black Font Distro, Takeover Tuesday, we'd really appreciate it. Um, quick shout out to our sponsors, of course, uh, Wellington Breweries, Hellas Lager, Deadly Grounds Coffee, and Twisted Teas. And of course, I'm wearing a Twisted Tea right now, uh, Return of the Living Dead Part 2, one of my all-time favorite artworks uh, and uh, really, really awesome company. And we can, couldn't thank all of our sponsors sponsors more for their support um, of course uh, through these challenging couple of years now rolling up on two years uh, but they have kept us going and we definitely do appreciate um, uh, everything that they've done for us um, now we've got a really great program uh, for you tonight uh, we've got uh, if you have you know, if you didn't follow us on Instagram today, we've got the awesome Derek Prince Cox. He is the host of the walk show and he's in the studio tonight. He's currently in the green room, giving me the thumbs up. And uh, we're going to uh, talk about uh, his awesome podcast and his, his interview series. He's been working on for quite some time uh, as well as some of his favorite horror flicks and some of uh, uh, you know, his new projects that he has coming up. Of course, um, as you can see on the ticker below, uh, he's got a new project called Reciprolog and he's got a brand new single called the violence exposed, uh, which we'll get to in a second in I can tell you a little bit more about. Um, and uh, listen, um, of course, there's some rock and roll going to happen this this episode, and we couldn't be happier to have Derek here in the studio. And but before we get there, you guys know the drill: we got to hit the news. Top story. Top, 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 top story. We'll give you the world. We'll give you the world. This may be. Important decision of your life. You can't stand the heat. Get out of the kitchen. Any special message for all the kids watching at home? You can't stand the heat. Get out of the kitchen. Top story. And remember, we care. We care, care, care. There are certain inherent risks that come with the territory. Top story. Top, top, top story. Okay, and we're back with another edition of the news. I've got my shirt and tie on. I've got the, my blazer on. And uh, listen, let's jump into our top story right now. Um, we have a really cool announcement to make, and that is the fact that we are actually going to expand uh, Takeover Tuesday a little bit. And we're actually going to do sort of like a, a um, I don't know if you'd call it like a hot panel, hot stove type of uh um, talk series um, about some of our favorite favorite horror franchises and some other stuff that we have coming up. So, uh, like I mentioned last episode, we were talking about the Scream reboot. We were talking about the new Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie that's coming out on uh, Netflix, and uh, we couldn't be happier to have uh, a long line of guests that I've reached out to. Uh, some uh, people that have been past guests on the show, they're actually going to rejoin us and talk to us about uh, some of their favorite horror movies and uh, some other stuff as well. I don't want to give too much away, but uh, um, thanks everyone for, um, uh, of course, 
uh, making this show uh, the success that it is. And we do really appreciate your support. And this is going to be just another thing that we're going to kind of get out there uh, so people can check it out and get our sort of my take on a few of the my favorite horror movies as well um quick uh mention about a physical media uh we're not gonna take too much time on this but i uh, just wanted to point it out uh physical media review this week is uh the new album by corn uh legendary new metal band uh yeah, I got Walk giving me the thumbs up this is obviously part of our teenage years but uh what I wanted to point out was the fact that this cd you know whatever 15 bucks actually came with a really cool patch inside. So you got this patch and it's pretty big that can go on a jean jacket, which is where mine's going to go. Um, but really cool thinking outside the box, people, um, CD companies, movie companies, please continue to do that um, because it keeps physical media alive and gives you a little bit of a bonus as well for people that have supported your product over the years. Um, we love patches as well here at Black Font Distro. You can get your own Black Font Distro patch at our online store at blackfontdistribution.com. And there might be some more interesting patches coming out. Uh, I don't know. I don't want to give too much away, but uh, stay tuned. Uh, check out our website. Check out our Instagram. We might have some patch news coming out very, very soon. Now, moving on, of course, it wouldn't be a news report if we didn't do a uh, bi-weekly installment of the fried chicken sandwich report. That's where I go out and try a I go out and try a fried chicken sandwich and tell you how good it is. And of course, this week, uh, we tried to find something new and we found a really, really cool place in Toronto called Cluck Clucks. Um, that's just a fun name to say, Cluck Clucks. So uh, you're welcome. And here's a picture of me. Here, here I am eating uh, one of their fried chicken sandwiches. Uh, pretty decent. Um, it's got a uh, really, really nice sauce, really thick, um, uh, sweet pickles. I think those are the bread and butter pickles. Perhaps someone can correct me in the comments below, but uh, um, bread and butter pickles, really nice cuts of chicken. It was a $10 lunch special, so the price was right. Really solid sandwich. Um, it checks a lot of boxes for me, and I couldn't I couldn't recommend this one enough. I'm giving it a solid four out of five. Of course, we rate everything based on the star movie rating system. Uh, only half stars and full stars for these reviews, so four out of five for Cluck Clucks in Toronto. And of course, let's go to the standings. Um, we've got our top 10 here. Cluck Clucks coming in at number three. Uh, tied for number three and four are held uh, four to five with Cluck Clucks fried chicken sandwich. And of course the Zinger Chick Zinger Burger, uh, but still holding the top spot is Coco Chicken fried chicken sandwich, uh, chicken joint out of Guelph, Ontario, as well as Tall Tree Chicken Sandwich Co. out of Hamilton. Those, those two are tied uh, four and a half out of five each. Um, they are both amazing chicken sandwiches. And uh, if you get a chance, um, please go and support any of these on our top 10. I can't remember which one fell off, um, but Wendy's classic chicken sandwich, three out of five, as well as the A&W chicken buddy burger uh, and the Zare's crispy chicken sandwich looking dangerously close to the bottom of the list. Um, so if you've got a suggestion for a fried chicken joint that we should try out, um, please email us at takeover at and we'll try our best as long as it's not a thousand miles away. We'll try our best to get over there and have ourselves a fried chicken sandwich. Now, uh, moving on, um, our guest tonight is Derek Prince Cox of The Walk Show. Uh, he's the host of the successful podcast, of course, called The Walk Show. And he's an extremely accomplished musician as well. He's played in such metal bands as Arise and Ruin, Wakeless, and Five Years, and Thunderbags, just to name a few. And having honed his craft while touring most of North America, Derek now divides his time between the, his successful interview series on The Walk Show, while also creating some original content for others. With The Walk Show recently celebrating its 100th episode, this guy really is the epitome of consistency. Now, his new project is called Reciprolog. Uh, they've released, recently released a brand new single called The Violence Exposed, which we're going to play for you in just a second. Um, and uh, all the proceeds from the sale of this track are going to be donated to the Black Heritage uh, sorry, Guelph Black Heritage Society. Um, so we're going to put up, put up the link uh, as well. You can go to their band camp, uh, buy the track for whatever you want. Um, it's a five minute rock and tune. It's, it's got a great hook in it. And uh, you know what? You're, you're supporting a really, really great cause. So uh, like I said, all the proceeds from the sale of this track through Bandcamp are going to be donated to the Guelph Black Heritage Society. And we'll be discussing why Derek chose this particular cause coming up. But uh, first, let's take a listen to this rock and new tune so you get a full understanding of how awesome this guy really is. Uh, I'm going to pump his tires uh, because he's a good friend of mine, a good friend of the show. Uh, he's helped us out in the past. And of course, um, it'd be really, really cool to uh, uh, make him feel a little bit uncomfortable on the show. Uh, that's uh, that's part of my job. Uh, but of course, um, this is the violence exposed from Reciprolog, uh, featuring Ryan Drury as on a guest vocal spot as well. Uh, we've got Derek, aka The Walk, live on the other side, and we'll get to chatting with him right after this.
All right. And that was uh, The Violence Exposed by Reciprolog. And uh, what an amazing track. And I've got live in the studio, virtually live in the studio at least, uh, Derek Prince Cox, who is the uh, creator of this uh, really, really cool project, um, host of The Walk Show, amongst other things. My friend, my good friend, I feel like this has been forever to try and set up, but uh, thanks so much for taking the time and, and, and joining the program. How are you? I am great, and thank you so much for having me. I, uh, I have my Cavan coffee, and I know awesome. you are repping Deadly Grounds coffee, so it'll be a bit of a battle of the coffees tonight. <laughs> um, may, may the best coffee win. It's, uh, it's kind of like the Super Bowl of podcasting, if you think about it. Oh man! Well, uh, if it's anything like the the uh, the Super Bowl that we just saw on Sunday uh, between the Bengals and the Rams, um, uh, I guess we're gonna get into some controversy, right? No, just kidding. Missed calls. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, Oof! Yeah. Oof. How much time <laughs> you got, buddy? <laughs> how much? How much money did everyone list, uh, lose? Right. So. Um, but it, listen, um, I just want to throw this out there to every, anyone who's listening. Uh, we do appreciate everyone tuning in. If you've got a question for myself, uh, for the show or for, or for Derek, f- feel free to leave it in the comments section below on whatever platform you're listening in on. And we will try and get to them in real time and throw them up on the screen and get some answers for you as the, uh, as the show goes on. Um, but, uh, let's, I wanted to jump in on this because, um, you know, this is such a great track. I, I know you you kind of showed it to me a, a, a while ago when you were writing it. Um, for the most part, of, of course, Ryan Drury is, is, does a guest vocal spot on this, but you recorded this whole project by yourself, right? The, the drums, guitars, everything. Is that correct? Yeah, so I played everything on it um, other than the, the vocals and the bridge, which was uh, Drury kicking my ass all over the studio. But um, uh, Alex Snape handled all the recording duties and mixing um and mastering so i definitely got to shout him out in nomadic arts awesome awesome and uh of course i mean you're like i mentioned on the top of the program uh you're donating all the proceeds from uh from the sale of the track uh to the guelph black heritage society um of course you know it's black here it's black history month this this month uh of course in february um but you know for those of you those of uh you know, people who can't see us, it's a couple of slightly overweight white dudes. Um, what can you tell us uh, on this podcast, at least? Um, what can you tell us about uh, about the project? Like, how did it come to be? And why was it important for you to to kind of make this this cause something worth supporting? Well, I always wanted to do a solo project uh, ever since I was in high school. Uh, but this song, for whatever reason, it took me this long to get off the ground. Uh, this song... It was basically, I wrote it after I went to the Black Lives Matter demonstration uh, in Guelph back in 2020. And it was just, uh, it was just really powerful. It was a very powerful day. And uh, yeah, I kind of went home and I had a few beverages and I kind of thought about things. And, you know, once I was able to sort of process everything, once it was more than just like a holy shit moment, um, you know, I started kind of writing some ideas down and it kind of came from there, man. Nice. And, uh, I mean, this isn't the first time you've supported, uh, like a cause with, a with music. Um, obviously for those of you out there who don't know Derek's history, I mean, you've been around a while, uh, played in a whole ton of bands, a whole ton of musical projects. And I mean that, I mean that in the nicest possible, <laughs> you're as old as dirt, man. No, it's a no, nice way uh, of putting it, dude. Uh, no, but you've always you've always been in, involved in some type of musical project, usually multiple multiple ones at the same time. Uh, but this isn't your first uh, first time uh, supporting a cause, especially in the in the tri city city area and specifically in the Guelph area. Um, why is that important to you to support you know, things around there? And, and what can you tell us about you know what you supported in the past as well? Well, dude, you know who got me into raising money when I can is is this guy named Benner, actually a million years ago. <laughs> um, you and I are both are that, that kind of person. And I did pick that up from you, man. So, uh, it started with, uh, Movember and then, uh, remember the ALS ice bucket challenge. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I did a couple of years of books for kids through the Guelph Mercury. Uh, and then there was walk stock in 2019 where we raised some money for hospice Wellington. And I wasn't really able to do anything throughout the pandemic. Now, truthfully, I probably was able to do you know, something, but I just, uh, it took me a while to kind of find my footing, man. So this was an opportunity to, uh, to keep on going. And I, and I know you are, uh, very like-minded when it comes to, uh, being charitable. Well, I actually didn't know you were going to say that. So, uh, thanks for putting me on the spot. Um, but I, but I, 
but I appreciate that, man. Um, yeah, I mean, I, th- I think I just sort of, I always approached it like, you know, if you can do a little good, um, great. And, and sometimes, sometimes that's all, that's, that's all it takes. I, I know I was down at the, uh, at the Black Lives Matter, um, the, the, the march that they had in Guelph. Um, so I, I didn't see you down there because there was literally like, I think there was over 8,000 people. I think there might have even been more, but there was thousands of people. I've, and I don't think I've ever been a part of something like that either. Um, and of course, like we went down to, you know, support obviously what had happened in, and, uh, in friends of ours. Uh, I think that's kind of for me at least that's, and I don't know if I'm sure you feel the same way, but, um, you know, we have a lot of mutual friends and we have friends that we know and that it was just a way to support them, uh, to go down and say, you know, this, th- like it's important. I mean, something, and, and I always say that, always say that kind of close encounters reference is some, sometimes a, a kind of like a joke sometimes, but I think in this case, it really does drive the point home. Like it was, it was a pretty powerful afternoon and, um, it's something that I know will stick with me. And I thought about this, uh, while I listened to that song too. Hey, well, I'm, I'm glad that it could put you into that headspace, man. And it's, it's one of those things where, you know, when I went down there, um, I went down there to say jack shit, you know what I mean? And just, just absorb and just listen. And so, um, you know, writing a song about it, I, I don't know, like, <laughs> I hope I'm not stepping on toes by doing that. I mean, uh, certainly nobody needs to hear from me about this, this topic. Uh, there are much better people to kind of, um, to, to move that ball uh, forward. But I don't know. I just I I felt so moved by the experience that I just felt compelled to write something um, about it. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Well, like I like I mentioned, uh, it's a, it's a great track. And um, for anyone listening to as well, um, what we're gonna do is uh, we're Black Von Distro is actually gonna support this cause as well, uh, which means that anyone listening live tonight, if you have uh, an email of a friend uh, that you'd like to send the song to. Um, please drop it in the comments or email us at takeover at blackfondistribution.com. And what we're going to do is we're actually going to gift uh, a song. We're going to pay for the song to be delivered to whomever you'd like it delivered to. Uh, we think it's a great cause. It's a great track and it's a bang in tune. Uh, so all those things together, it's worthwhile. All you have to do is just email us at takeover at blackfondistribution.com. Give us the email of, of who you'd like to who you'd like to send this track to and Black Fond Distro will be paying for it. And again, of course, all the proceeds are going to support uh, Guelph Black Heritage Society uh, here in Guelph, Ontario. So uh, there you have it. Uh, of course, if you don't want to do that, just want to buy the track and contribute. Um, of course, you can. I just sent out the link, uh, but we'll throw that up on the bottom of the screen as well. Um, just now, let's just see if we can do this. There we go. Uh, so we'll leave that up for the majority of the program, at least. So check it out. Bandcamp uh, Reciprolog. It's the new project from Derek Prince Cox. But uh, Derek is, um, you know, a.k.a. The Walk. We're going to get into that right now as well. Um, but, uh, you know, you're, you're, like I said, at the top of the hour, you're an accomplished musician. You've worked on multiple projects, but one of the, one of your most successful projects has been your podcast, the walk show. Um, you know, you just celebrated your hundredth episode, which is no small feat. Um, tell us a little bit about how you got into like, like how, what drew you into podcasting originally and, and how have you kept it going through all these years? Well, I was afraid you were going to ask me, you know, tell us about what happened at that hundredth episode. Um, I don't think uh, either one of us remember, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, man. I mean, I started it December of 2017 and uh, for a bunch of different reasons, but I mean, I definitely had a lot of help from Steve Vargas who was doing the take her wide podcast uh, at that time. Right. And um, yeah, he was super supportive in terms of like, you know, helping me with the technical things. Cause you know, as well as anybody, there's a million things on the back end of a podcast. Um, and it was just sort of a way, um, and this might sound cheesy and, and you know, in fact, I know it's going to, but you know, here it is, man. It just really felt like a way to contribute, you know, like how can I serve my community being like an older dude? My touring days are long behind me. Um, I can still put out music, uh, but you know, what else can I do to sort of be of service to the community? Um, and podcasting seemed to be uh, the, the right fit for me. Well, I've been lucky enough to be on the program three times. Uh, and I was a guest on the hundredth episode. 
um <laughs> yeah, which is a were. great which is a great yeah which is a great episode <laughs> uh if you want to check out another podcast um make sure you go to apple Podcasts or spotify or wherever you get your favorite podcasts and download um the walk show uh, new episodes bi-weekly um you're doing it twice a month basically 24 or 25 times a year which is which is pretty incredible uh, i'm trying to keep pace uh but it's tough um but uh and also if you're looking for a laugh uh, check out the 100th episode um which i was i which i'm on which makes it better than all better than the rest no, <laughs> better um, than all the other ones <laughs> no but uh um no but it's, it's got tons of great interviews with uh, uh local talent uh, musicians uh other people doing other cool stuff and uh yeah i can't thank you enough for being uh uh for letting me come on at least and just talk my bullshit for a couple hours each time uh it's it's a fun it's a fun show for sure um, well, p people like you, dude. I mean, uh, lots of people listen to those episodes, so. Which I'll is why I had, I had to return the favor, right? I had to get you on here <laughs> and, uh, we got to talk it. We got to talk some horror, of course. Um, because, uh, Hey, we're black phone distro. We're a horror distribution company out of Canada. And, uh, you know, it wouldn't be a horror show if we didn't talk about some horror stuff. So, um, yeah. And, and again, like, look at these lids, eh? That's how you do it. Kids, you support each other. And that gets the job done sometimes. So um, for those of you listening and can't see that, I'm wearing a walk show toque. And my good friend Derek is wearing a Black Von Distro trucker hat. So, which you can both buy. I'm not part of the convoy, convoy though, just so you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. A Black Von Distro. <laughs> uh, uh, just call it a mesh back. Mesh back sporting hat. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Take, that, take that as you will. Yeah. You, gonna get controversial. We got a coffee war going on. We got a hat war going on. Uh, but let's just <laughs> talk about um uh let's talk about horror flicks because me and you have been horror fans for a long time. Uh just in general, like what drew you to horror films when you were like, when did you get into them? And like when do you, what like tell us some of your favorites, like walk us down that road. No pun intended. Uh <laughs> I see what you did there. Uh, I mean, dude, I am a product of the 80s. So, I, I mean, you know, you were there. It, like, horror was, like, like Freddy Krueger was, like, Robert Plant. You know what I mean? Like, it was, it really was, like, like rock stardom um, with a lot of horror franchises. And, I mean, it didn't have to be a franchise to be awesome, but I, I think that had a lot to do with elevating horror as a genre to the masses. And when you're a kid in the 80s, what do you want to do? You, you want to watch the movies your parents won't let you watch. So that's how I got into horror. Um, and I've been a huge fan ever since. Awesome. And would you say, uh, would you say Friday the third, or sorry, uh, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street is probably your favorite franchise? Definitely my favorite franchise. Uh, my favorite horror movie right now, and I feel like it doesn't get nearly enough love, is Society, man, from 89. Oh yeah, yeah. Our friends, uh, we got some friends at uh, Witch Finger Podcast, and they love that movie. Like they, they think it's the greatest movie ever made, and it's like it's it's phenomenal. Like the amount of practical effects, and I feel like that oh, always dude. gets brought up. Like I feel like I feel like uh, practical effects. I know me and you are big thing, uh, big uh, fans of the thing as well. I mm -hmm. mean, who is who isn't? But um, I feel like that's the thing that's missing in horror films today is that is that the practical effects sell it. And it can just be a practical effect of like maybe someone even coming out of a doorway or a room or something that's physical there. That's not CGI. I feel that is all the more creepier um, than if it's not right. A practical effect, literal butthead. Yeah. Literal, literal, butt. I mean, I wish I had, I wish I had, <laughs> how can you clip. beat that? <laughs> I wish I had that clip. Um, I know like, uh, yeah, a lot of the time for, for horror flicks. Uh, like I remember, um, I remember, a long time ago, me and you watched Insidious together. Yeah, and, buddy. And uh, we were like, hey, should we watch? Hey, we were like, Insidious is on. I think this is when like me and you lived together for a little while. And we had uh, uh, we had the movie network. And we were like, should we watch this Insidious movie? Like, we never heard anything about it. Like, we just heard that it was a creepy movie. It was made for low budget. And it was James Wan, right? So, uh, and I remember like turning off all the lights. We decided we're going to turn off all the lights and crank the like crank it super loud. And then like, freaked out a little bit just by watching that it makes you feel yeah, like a little kid again yes that scene like and you know the scene i'm talking about like with the you know the darth maul dude like right behind him oh, uh, yeah. in the kitchen like that whole scene i feel like it's like a i don't know like seven minutes of solid like dread and it doesn't let up yeah yeah and the little boy 
the little boy in the um uh like i always feel like james wan when he does horror flicks like i always feel like that's like that's kind of his key now where it's like the camera pans over something and you're like, Oh, like there's something over there in that corner, but you never really see it. And then it, and it's yeah. again, like you said, that dread, the sense of dread is kind of created over like however many minutes. And then that thing usually shows up again. Right. So have you watched the new James Wan produced uh, the TV show archive 81? I think it's called. No, but I've heard it's, I've heard it's amazing. Uh, yeah. You would dig it, man. Yeah, I, a friend of mine told me that that was like a must watch. Uh, actually, one of our one of our uh, directors um, uh, told me that like like that's a show you need to get into. It's it's really creepy, super well done. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's on my list, man. Uh, I mean, it's funny. It's like I always try and get into shows. Um, I'm pretty successful at it. I know you are too. I mean, obviously, we've both been riding a pandemic for two years. So, you know, what else are you gonna do other than watch movies and music? Um, and work of course but uh are you watching anything like recently like like uh show wise that that you think is worth checking out well i mean the wife and i did just finish archive 81 um we loved it um what else god i was watching um oh man show on um it's on netflix but it's a, a channel for like british show dead set I think it's okay. called where it's like the, uh, the reality show zombie apocalypse. Okay. It's I heard yeah. It, okay. Yeah. Like it's pretty interesting and I'm not much of a, I'm really picky with my zombie stuff. Like I'm a hardcore Romero guy. Like zombies don't run in my view. Um, oh, oh you're one of those guys. Uh, definitely one of those guys, <laughs> man. I mean, there are rules, you know, there are rules, yeah. but, uh, they're definitely running in this show and I don't know. I, it's such a fresh take on the, on the zombie apocalypse thing that I'll let it, I'll let it slide. Uh, do you think like, so, so no fast zombies ever? Like, I mean, it's always, no, you're always not going to dig yourself out of the grave and like all of a sudden you're Donovan Bailey. You know what I mean? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, for anyone listening out there, if you got uh, if you got comments on that, uh, fast zombies or slow zombies, uh, let us know in the comment section below, and we'll try and get to you throughout the broadcast. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm interested to hear. That. I liked, I thought like um, I like the fast zombies in um, like I just like the concept of 28 Days Later when that movie came out. Where I do too, but th those aren't really zombies, though, are they? It's like a virus, right? So it's well, right. It's, it's not like yeah, people people get eaten, but you don't like you can get that you can get infected from from something other than a bite i guess which i thought was kind of a cool take and and then the dawn of the dead remake uh by Zack snyder which i still think is like one of his best flicks um i just thought that was a fun movie to go and see but i get like you run out of ideas right like when 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 and especially when zombies can sometimes run faster than the humans like <laughs> yeah like, like you don't really stand uh. a chance right I mean, I would take, if there was a zombie apocalypse, I would take slow zombies, 100%. Like, I would not want fast zombies in real life. No, but no. The, but there the just has thing. to be some rules. Like, there has to be, I don't know, like, if they're faster dead than alive, like, you know, should all the triathletes just, like, kill themselves and, you know, come back from the dead? Like, what are we talking about here? But they went, yeah. <laughs> Is that an, Olymp an Olympics plug right there? <laughs> just get infected, yeah. man. Come back. Win a gold medal. <laughs> um, just want to throw this up. Uh, we've got a couple comments here, uh, from the OHFP friends, long time listeners of the show. Um, uh, just the devil horns. I'm assuming that's from the track that we played. And of course, uh, just a quick follow up from what we were just Cheers. talking about, uh, from Daryl, Daryl Ailes, uh, hundred percent too much green screen and horror ruins all the tension. Uh, yeah. Uh, it ruins mm -hmm. a lot of, a lot of tension in any film. I feel like green screen, I get like they're, you know, they got to do certain, certain things. You can't build everything, but um i just i don't know i just kind of feel like like when you can tell it's not it's not real like it kind of pulls you out of everything um and i feel like that's a problem with a lot of movies nowadays especially big budget stuff like uh but i don't know what do i know i'm just some guy right so um <laughs> Uh, just got a quick, uh, quick comment to you as well from John, a uh, longtime listener of the show, of course, as well. Uh, he said, uh, uh, I feel if the world was run by overrun by zombies, they would have have to be fast or they would just get picked off by all the hicks and military. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. It, it, it just depends. It depends what the ratios are. Right, John? Like, I mean, if there was like a, if there was a thousand zombies, like, sure. But like if there was like a million, I don't know, I guess you like just it like. 
I understand, like, adapt or die, I get it, but they do that throughout the Romero series. I mean, they're not, yeah, they're not running, like, marathons, but, I mean, they learn to communicate, they learn to kind of go through water, you know, like, I, I still feel like they are learning to adapt, it's just at a more <laughs> realistic pace, I don't know, like, there's, yeah, now we're talking about the reality of zombie flicks, but... I just, I, my suspension of disbelief, I think that's what the, the cool kids call it. It's just, uh, I don't know. It's got to be Romero rules for me. Like there was a time where I think it was in Land of the Dead that like one of the zombies remembers, kind of has, remembers sort of what he did in the past. Um, so I can't remember exactly. So maybe someone can remind me, but like, uh, but, but essentially like he, he remembered his old job because it was essentially like brain trauma and that's kind of how he treated it. And it was, that's a really cool idea. But then every movie had that in it. Like every movie was like, you know, there's garbage men, zombies and teacher zombies. And <laughs> like, <laughs> so I don't know, man. Um, okay. So, I mean, let's, uh, as far as like other horror films go do you have a do you have a favorite genre do you think that uh you would gravitate more towards is it more like supernatural or do you like i mean or is zombies your thing or definitely supernatural zombies typically are not my thing other than you know romero which i, I think i've probably made that too clear um but i think paranormal stuff for me like that's what does it uh slashers not so much although i have a you know a great deal of respect for the the classic thrashers right uh, like, how could you not? But I, I, I'm just the kind of person where, like, if somebody comes, like, stalking my house, like, I'm just going to grab the bat and either I'm going down or you are. You know what I mean? Like, so it has to be something supernatural that really uh, gives me the willies. Mm. Right. So you can't you can't fight it. It's the it's the unknown. Yes. From the, from the place beyond. Yeah. Like, I thought Hereditary was fucking incredible. Yeah, I mean, that's a movie that keeps coming up. I know it's sort of getting, you know, it's funny because like in horror circles and horror communities, that that's the movie that's starting to kind of become a bit like The Shining where like too many people like it. it and it's it's so funny because it's like me and you have talked about this a lot in time about bands. But it's a totally the same thing. Like something's gotten too popular and everyone's just like either, well, it's not that great. You know what I mean? But it's like, but if I was to show a movie to someone being like, here's a scary movie, you want to watch a scary movie? Here's a couple I can recommend out of the gate. Um, like Hereditary would be up there. Uh, terrifying, great ending too. Um, and as well as The Shining. And and it, they are, those are kind of like, I mean, I feel like Hereditary is kind of creeping up on that too, where people are like, yeah, it's not that great because everyone likes it. But I don't know. I think it's one of the most effective horror movies released in the last probably at least 10 years. I mean, everyone likes it for a reason, you know, like I'm on a couple of Facebook groups uh, around horror movies. Um, and yeah, I see all the hereditary hate and people will say stuff like, um, oh, God, I just watched that new one from the strangers guy, uh, the dark and the wicked. OK. Um, and it, it kind of uses some of those like those tricks in hereditary. I think I, I'm not giving anything away by saying that. But you get people, you know, in these Facebook groups going like, oh, yeah, they're just using that like art house, like tactic, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, are you calling it an art house tactic? Because it's not it's just not the same rehashed bullshit like that's been used for decades. Is that what you mean by art house, you know, tactics? I thought it, it I just thought, seems so stupid yeah, to me. I, like I thought so <laughs> the one so Ari Aster, the director of that movie, like he's got some it's something about a. Uh, like old people uh, in movies, if they're present, if they're, they're always seem like super creepy if they're presented in a particular way. And Ari Aster is just being like, well, I'm just going to have like old naked people like that are going to be super <laughs> creepy, which is super creepy. And I don't care what anyone It is said. super like, creepy. If a naked old person was in your basement and like <laughs> you went down to do the laundry, guess what? <laughs> You're not walking by them. You're running out of your house. So I, I don't know. I, I feel like, um, especially for that, uh, it's like, I, 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 it's funny. I was just talking about this too. Um, we watched, uh, uh, I watched it follows recently, uh, which is another movie. It just, I think is brilliant. And I, I still cannot figure out how that movie hasn't had multiple sequels. Like I can't figure out why that didn't become a franchise like saw or like insidious or anything like that. And, and I don't know if you've seen that movie or, or yeah, I really liked it. Yeah. It's like, just a weird well, creepy movie here's a question about it follows like do you think 
So when you see a movie like that that you that you enjoyed, like we both enjoyed it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, do you kind of want to protect the the you know the name and 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 you don't want them to do sequels or or do you want to see sequels? Like, what's your thought uh, on on a movie like that? I mean, it it depends. Like, it depends on on. Uh, I guess it depends on how strong the concept is and where you can take it. Like, I really liked Insidious too. Uh, and I actually haven't seen the rest of the insidious movies. It's like on my to-do list. Right. But, but I've always thought the second one was, was really good. I thought conjuring one and two were really good. Um, conjuring three, maybe not so much, but, uh, I, I don't know. I just feel like if the concept's there and you can run with it. Um, but I do feel like the easier, the concept, the easier it is to make a sequel that resonates. Um, just because it's just straightforward. And I think like we were talking earlier about the eighties movies, like, um like they were just churning those out like the friday the 13th movies they were just like they were just firing them out like once a year right <laughs> yeah um, and that's what they did with saw too right i mean <laughs> saw was like there's no real character development it was just like oh these muppets in a room and like some of them are going to go through that machine you know um yeah. but again it was fun <laughs> because they were like look every you know i remember the tagline for saw was just like it's halloween that's mean that means it's saw like <laughs> It was like, well, what are you going to do for Halloween? I guess I'll go see the Saw movie, right? So I yeah. miss that about movie theaters. I think that's fun. Um, so I'd be, I would welcome that for sure. But it's, it's hard to make a scary movie um, nowadays. Like I know um, a lot of the conversations that, uh, that I've had with people are just like the, because cell phones, right? You can look anything up. They, you know, you can order anything you want online. Um, like, is it, and and you have to take that device away from people to make things truly scary. Like you have to isolate people. And uh, that's what um, Ali Chapel, my last guest on the show, uh, that's what she was saying too, was like, you got to isolate people to make that fear come through. Right. Um, and it's funny because I feel like you lose your phone now. You're like, Oh my God, where's my phone? Like, what do, what do I do? So like, I can't imagine that people, especially they, especially the generation that's younger than us, Sorry for anybody out there listening to this. Uh, don't take offense to this, but like, if if that generation lost their phones and they were like out in the wilderness and a bunch of like, you know, murdering psychopath hillbillies were chasing them, like, I don't know if they're living, right? But I don't know. What you they would do. you guys need to write that right. movie, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, so. yeah, young kid loses their phone and then they're they're freaking out and they run into the wilderness like off the grid and they meet up with a bunch of like people our age that like. Are running away from their last hydro bill and like, like I, they, like they I, have to band together like i feel like you could you could you could lure like like if let's say some some teenager was in the wilderness like you could lure them into like a cabin just by promising them like sweet wi-fi right <laughs> like oh my yeah, phone man. doesn't work he's like just come in here man i got some i got some sick wi-fi in here man like yeah like, the, like wi-fi it, and it, pumpkin it really spice lattes come on in yeah, the internet's in the basement, man. Just jack your phone in. It's cool. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> guess what? You're dead. So I, I feel like that should be written into a movie. I think that's a good way to get someone, get somebody somewhere where you where you want them, right? But uh yeah, I don't know, man. I, I like um like I like sequels. It's like it's just you wanna like sequels are tough. Like I remember someone told me this long time ago, um, that that said uh even if um you had told me that the matrix sequels were going to be kind of shitty. I'd and, and I had the option to say, make them or not make them. Like I would still say, make them. Cause I'd still want to see them. Oh, huh, okay. Right. Which is, I don't know, kind of like, you know, it's maybe hindsight's 2020, but I just feel like if you can add something to the story, it makes it kind of cool. Um, I recently just watched uh, all the Halloween movies. Uh, I still have to watch Halloween three. I haven't got through Halloween three, but I watched all the, uh, uh, the original movies. Uh, the remakes and reboots I'm actually going on uh, and shout out to uh, my friend, uh, Rob Bellamy for his, for his podcast uh, as well. Um, but we're doing kind of like a round table type thing too, talking about all the Halloween films. And it was kind of cool. Like watching them, like I, every night I'd watch a different one and you can kind of see sort of what they were trying to do with the sequels a little bit and then stuff worked and then stuff <clears throat> didn't work. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, the, the, the tricky thing nowadays is like, what sequels are what sequels and what timelines they're in. And like, um, like, I mean, they're just doing this, the, the, you know, the, the reboot or whatever. Right. Which is sort of like you taking legacy characters from the original movie and then putting them into a new, a new, uh, a film. 
and whether or not that works and whether or not people want to see it. And I think the first Hall the Halloween recent Halloween remake with Jamie Lee Curtis, like it only takes the first film and ignores everything else, like anything else that came after it. So it's like a direct sequel. So now you can watch the movies in any sequence you want. It's, it's bizarre. I don't know. How do you, do you have a preference for that? Like, do you, do you want a sequel to be a direct sequel to the original stuff or? Uh, oh man, it's, I, I think it really depends on the story. I'm not married to a, you know, an ideology one way or the other there. Uh, but I do kind of want to start a, a war in your comment section and say, I liked Halloween three, the best out of all the Halloweens. Which ones? Oh, Halloween three. Ha yeah. 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 Bring the, bring the ruckus. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, like it's such a weird thing i've had this conversation a couple times too about um the difference between like nostalgia and fan service right and and having how close you want your sequel to kind of tie into the original timeline um and of course you mentioned anything that relates to that and it's like people say oh it's an, it's an, it's fan service and nostalgia and like i feel like those two things are different um but at the same time like don't you want your sequel to kind of mesh into kind of the story that came before it like i feel that's important right I mean, yes, and I, I, again, I really think it depends on the story. And I know with Halloween 3, or at least what I've heard, is that John Carpenter was trying to kind of make it like more of an anthology. So like every part would be like sort of a different story around the holiday. Well, not holiday, but around Halloween. Um, yeah, yeah. That was is that movie. right? Or am I, am I pulling that out of my you-know-what? No, like that's, that's uh, that. Yeah. That's how I understand it too. So the idea was like every Halloween, there'd be a new movie that came out. It'd just be a Halloween movie to go and see. Uh, and every movie would be different, but because the first one was so successful, they just made uh, a direct sequel with Michael Myers for, for Halloween two. And then they tried to do that for Halloween three, but uh, it bombed. So they, <laughs> so they scrapped that idea and just went back to like Michael Myers. Right. So, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, I just saw Scream 5. Uh, pretty cool. I love that series too. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, it's, it's funny because uh, the Scream movies are hilarious to watch because they're so tapped into kind of what's happening when they, when they were made. Um, and Scream 4 being standing, like Scream 4 is kind of about reboots because at the time they were rebooting like Nightmare on Elm Street, Friday the 13th, and like uh, Michael Bay, you know, executive producing them and all this stuff. And so that's what that movie is about, but it feels like it was made like two years ago and it was made like 2011. So it stands up really, really well. Um, but I am not sure. I don't know. I, I, I'm, it's a mixed bag. I mean, I like sequels, but there's been some really horrible fucking sequels made. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude. Uh... So I don't know. Uh, okay. Let's just, uh, let's just jump in here. So, uh, okay. Just going back to, um, all right, let's go back to take a step back to our zombie uh, um, uh, conversation here. John was saying, uh, uh, oh, no, he, he already, oh, here we go. Sorry, wrong comment here. But yeah, John's saying Dawn of the Dead remake is one of the best intros to a zombie movie. I would agree. Um, I love that intro when I think it's Sarah Polly. She wakes up and there's like zombies everywhere and she walks out to her like suburban neighborhood and like the whole thing's on fire. I got to um, be honest, I'm going to piss people off again, I'm sure here. And I've never seen it. Because the, the original was such a masterpiece to me that I just never, yeah, that's never fair. wanted to see it, you know? Yeah, I always felt like it should have been called, like, I don't know. I always feel it should have been called something else. But Zack Snyder went on and made another dead movie called Army of the Dead, which I don't know if you've seen it, but it's, <laughs> we could talk we had a whole, we could talk for a whole other podcast on uh, the, the pros and cons of that flick. So, uh, but uh, anyway, I love Zack Snyder. Shout out to Zack Snyder. But um yeah, Army of the Dead, I wasn't the mass, most biggest fan of. So, um, and and sorry, uh, John, follow up to just said, uh, I liked Halloween 3, but what bothers me is that they call it Halloween 3. Should have been called something else. Uh, oh, how I hear a 10, 20 year old chick falls in love with a 50 year old. <laughs> LOL. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, John, that was a time in, in, uh, in, in time and space <laughs> called the 1980s. Yeah. Yeah. The 80s. Um, it was funny. Like, I was just watching, uh, uh, speaking of the 80s, I was just watching, uh, 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 Cobra Kai and um, uh, slight spoilers, but uh, how they bring in uh, um, uh, what's the guy's name that uh, Silver, 
who is the old good karate guy and he, it's in, he's in karate kid three right he just his performance in that movie is just like maniacal it's just crazy train right and uh in the show they just they just simply explain it away saying it was the 1980s and i was doing a lot of cocaine <laughs> <laughs> which is great as you, which is as like, you did as you did like, like how do you explain this over-the-top performance and they're like well we made the movie in 1988 or 89 so we'll just say it's cocaine so um yeah which is i think how you can explain like half of the 1980s to be honest if not more um but they were just doing stuff there that like i like they were just making movies especially horror flicks they were just kind of churning them out but also like first time directors first time actors kind of just doing what they wanted to do and having the ability to, to do that. Like, I don't know. It's, it was, it was kind of like a great time. And I think we grew up in the best time for that to happen. Yeah. Like it, it's good that a lot of that shit got called out. <laughs> you know, it was definitely necessary. Um, but there was also a lot of great movies back then. I mean, I don't know how you square that circle, but I, I guess that's how I, I try to in my mind. I don't know. Like I was watching creep show too, not that long ago. And uh, in the raft, uh, super rapey part in the raft. Yeah. And I'm just like, holy fuck, like, what's going on? And I've seen it, you know, a hundred times, but I don't know. I guess this time I was just like, whoa, like, this is, uh, this is, this is not cool. <laughs> I think it's, I think it's, uh, it's how things have aged, right? Um, and, I, like I always like I, it's kind of it's funny because I mentioned this before too. It's like so stuff that was made in the 1970s, right, is 50 years old now. Like it's creeping up to 50 50 years old. So stuff like Clockwork Orange, uh, I think Deliverance, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, uh, like these films are kind of like you know. And so the 80s is only like you know whatever 35 40 years ago. So we're kind of creeping up into that time. If you went back and did the same thing. Like if you, if you took a movie that was made in like, let's say 1975, I mean, 50 years prior to that was 1925, which is insane to think about. Right. And I just feel like society in general, I don't mean to say, that sounds like such a shitty pompous thing to say, but just society in general. Okay. Go with me here is that I don't feel like a lot of things have really changed in the last 20 years. Like it doesn't like 2022 doesn't feel terribly different than 2002 if you compared it to like 2002 in like 1982 like and yeah something about the 80s where they were just like let's just give all these let's give all these young directors coming up shots and see what comes out the other end and i mean there was films obviously like spielberg and but there was like back to the future and gremlins like like i remember watching gremlins recently and uh yeah like a uh in in my girlfriend had never seen it and we watched it and <laughs> like halfway through she was like how did this movie get made and i go i don't know like because it's such a bizarre film it's like it's a christmas movie but not really and it's like a it's it's gory but it's not restricted it's this weird kind of like odd movie that floats around right so i don't know anyway um but listen uh and marketed to kids if i can jump in just like that shit was totally marketed to kids, you know? So like there were like RoboCop action figures for like one of the goriest non-horror movies I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. Uh, and Ram- sorry. Rambo I just felt Car- like I needed to interject there. Rainbow cartoon. That was another, <laughs> it's like, yeah. Rainbow, like the killing machine from Vietnam. It's like, you know what we can do, Jim? <laughs> I don't know. What's that, Bob? I think we can make a cartoon out of this and we can sell like action figures. Yeah. What, what uh, the fucking eighties, dude. I was trying to figure Unbelievable out. Unbelievable like, decade. Like what would be an equivalent of that today? I guess you would, it would be, I mean, everything's made for PG 13 now. Right. But uh, I'm trying to think of like an action movie that like a violent action movie, like what would come out that would be like a cartoon. I don't know. Sound off below people. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, let's just move on a little bit because I don't, I don't want to run out of time here, but I feel like we're going to go over the hour for sure. So as you say, stealing one of your lines going into o- o- OT, um but uh uh for those tuning in who don't know um you actually work on other projects for other people as well as uh, including us uh you are actually the person that recorded wrote recorded produced uh and did the voiceover for our intro track um for black Fun distros takeover tuesday so the track that you hear every week um that that was you uh from the ground up um 
do you want to tell us the story behind that from your side of things? Because I'd be interested to hear it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, Benner and I had a lot um, when he was starting up the uh, the show. Um, and, you know, like, a lot of it was just sort of like picking one because I'd been doing it for some time uh, just on technical aspects and things like that. And I'm not even quite sure how it came to be where you asked me to do the, the, the theme song. But, I mean, I jumped at the chance because, I mean, I love the podcast. Uh, love you, buddy. And um, oh, and it was a great opportunity for me to do something, um, you know, as an aspiring uh, sound engineer and, and a lifer musician. It was a great opportunity to uh, to do something that would actually be listened to by somebody. So, yeah. Awesome. Uh, now we announced this a while back, but we had a bit of a small little contest to, to figure out a name for this track because we just wanted to call it something cooler than just intro track. Um, so we have that uh, today ready to go. Um, and uh, I'm going to see if uh, uh, well, we'll tell you who gave the name too, but I wonder if you could guess, but uh, we're revealing the new name for Black Font Distro, uh, for the Black Font Distro Takeover Tuesday theme. That's the song that plays at the start of our podcast uh, each and every episode, uh, of course, written, written, recorded and produced by uh, Derek Prince Cox, my guest tonight from The Walk Show. Uh, let's reveal this name. Um, do you want to give us a little bit, as a drummer, do you want to give us a little bit of a drum roll? Uh, no, I think, I think we're good. <laughs> <laughs> all right all right here we go and the name is venom and denim 666 that's the name of the track uh so that's the name of our intro wow track. that's what it's going to be called uh pretty cool eh? let us know what you think about the name below um but uh yeah for uh for any for anyone who's curious um it was our uh, good friend friend of the show longtime friend and a friend of yours uh ben alexis that came up with that uh, of course. So that was his submission. Righteous. He was like venom and denim. And his quote was like, I don't know what it means, but I get it. I get that tattooed. So I was like, yeah, <laughs> right on. So if I count my thumbs, I could do the knuckles, right? Venom and denim. So oh, I just got my knuckles done, man. Fuck. <laughs> oh, well, dude, you can get rid of that. Get our, get our shit. Yeah. Right? Okay. I'll do my toes. <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, so let's uh, now. Uh, we do have a rapid fire segment of the of, of the show. Uh, that's where we put you on the spot and ask you five uh, hard hitting journalistic questions um, and get your your take on certain things. Um, I, I know you kind of knew this was coming, but uh, nonetheless, are you game to do this for uh, for the show? Yeah, let's give her, dude. Okay, awesome. So this is our rapid fire section. It's brought to you by Wellington Brewery's Hellas Lager. Uh, you can obviously take advantage of Wellington's uh, free local delivery in the Guelph area and also, uh, or you can visit their local brewery in Guelph, of course, as well, uh, or pick up some tins from your local LCBO or wherever you purchase your adult beverages. Uh, Wellington Brewery's Hellas Lager, Hellas Yeah or Hells Yeah or whatever, however you want to say it. It's a delightful, easy drinking beer. I've got it on my shelf behind me here, uh, two cans. And of course, with the spring and summer coming up, it's a great addition to anyone's fridge. Um, okay, so let's dive in here. Rapid fire questions. Uh, I know you pretty well, so I tried to tailor this uh, to get some kind of cool answers. Um, but let's go. Uh, you ready? Let's do it. Hopping in. Okay, rapid fire. Question number one. Yes or no? Are you a fan of the Q-tip scene from Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare? Yes. Okay. Like, I would elaborate on that, like, a hundred million percent. Sure. Elaborate. Elaborate away. Yeah, it's one of the best kills in, in the franchise. Okay. Right on. Uh, rapid fire question number two. You got to pick one. Uh, what's your favorite Nightmare on Elm Street film from the franchise? Oh, man. Uh, like right now it's four, but it would probably have to be three if, if it was, if I was picking forever. Okay. Distinguishing factors, but like, what do you like about each one? Uh, I just feel like four was, well, it was very similar to three. Uh, it was just a little smoother, uh, directed by Rennie Harlan of Die Hard 2. Um, <laughs> and yeah, it, it was just a little smoother and like the Roach Motel death was like one of the coolest things ever put onto film but yeah i i guess i would have to say like going forward forever ever it's probably got to be dream warriors okay also sick tune from uh oh yeah yeah sorry that's not for i feel like my answers aren't very rapid i apologize no that's all right it's it's kind of like 
name only, you know? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so rapid fire question number three. Help us out. Uh, you're starting a band, and you can pick a drummer to work the kit. Who are you picking? Mm. Uh, probably Marco Miniman, who has been on a Nick Johnston album, by the way. Um, fantastic guitar player from Guelph. If you haven't heard, uh, check him out. Okay. Uh, rapid fire question number four. Uh, tell us more. Uh, some people around the Tri-City area have affectionately referred to you as the Dave Grohl of Guelph. Can you elaborate Oof. as to where that story came from? Well, I mean, I think the first person that called me that might have been you. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, I know, It wasn't me. It wasn't me. I picked up on it, but I never, I never. Really? Yeah, yeah. I don't know, man. I mean, like, I'm honored, obviously. Who wouldn't be? But, uh, but that, I don't, I don't think that's the case. <laughs> other people around the area would differ but uh i think that's just a testament of how many people you've worked with and how much stuff that you do for the for the music community in, in the guelph area so uh yeah uh you're a humble man i know that um but uh i feel like you should wear that that badge of distinction or at least people shouldn't be afraid to tell you that because i think it's probably pretty true so uh but anyway uh, like i said enough of the pumping of the tires uh rapid <laughs> rapid fire number number question number five uh uh, who do you want? Uh, you've conducted over a hundred interviews on the walk show, uh, your podcast, of course, um, who is a guest that ha you haven't had on your program yet and that you'd love to interview in the future. I mean, one of my favorite vocalists of all time is Mike Olander from burnt by the sun. Um, it, I don't think it's that crazy, uh, of a get, if I were to, to snag him for an episode of the podcast, it's actually being talked about by mutual friends and podcasters. So yeah, I would have to say Mike Olander. Okay, fair enough. Okay, and that does it. That's it for uh, uh, Rapid Fire, of course. Uh, thanks so much for doing that. Uh, thanks for being a good sport. Hopefully those weren't too tough. I uh, didn't put you on the spot too much. But, uh, of course, Rapid Fire brought to us by uh, Wellington Brewery's Hellas Lager. Uh, Hellas Lager, Hellas Yeah. Uh, and thanks again for their sponsorship. And thanks, buddy, for for doing that. I, I appreciate that. Um, let's. Uh, we're just going to take a quick commercial break, and then uh, I've got a couple more questions for you. Are you able to stick around? Yes, sir. Okay, Love awesome. to. We'll be we'll be right back right after this. Black Fawn Distro. Movies, merchandise, available now at blackfondistribution.com. Okay, and we're back uh, with Black Fawn Distro's Takeover Tuesday. Um, big shout out to uh, everyone who provided music for tonight's episode. Of course, we've got uh, Derek Prince Cox live in the studio virtually, but he is live. We are broadcasting live to Facebook, Twitch, Twitter, and YouTube, and also retransmitting to Spotify and Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your uh, whatever your favorite platform is to get your podcasts. Uh, walk, uh, welcome back to the show. Um, of course, uh, a couple of things I wanted to talk to you about, um, and but. Uh, uh, I know that we, we sit around, we get together numerous times and just, you know, shot the shit, chew the cud, whatever, whatever you want your, whatever your expression. Um, and we, we always talk about, uh, you know, comparisons between uh, different industries and that sort of stuff sometimes, especially, uh, the music industry. And I just want to kind of get your take on, on, you know, there's definitely some comparisons between the music industry and the, in the movie industry. And, you know, if you had any kind of thoughts on that at all as to what you've seen kind of in the last few years. Hmm. I mean, I guess just the sense of community where it's, I don't know. I feel like talking to you, it's sort of come out that the movie industry is, is more of a sense of community. Um, and maybe a little less doggy dog, correct me if I'm wrong, but, um, I don't know. I think that sense of community is something that's, uh, it's similar in both industries. Um, you know, the sort of high, high tide raises all ships mentality, I guess is how I would put it, even though that's mm -hmm. not my saying, not even close, but I, I think it describes what, what the hell I'm trying to say here. Um, and you know, any advice that you could, you think is pertinent to anything, anybody kind of getting into the arts as, um, as far as, you know, what would you tell like someone in their twenties, maybe that, that wants to get either get into the music industry or, or the movie industry. I know, you know, you're involved with more, more of the music industry than the movie industry, but uh, I'm sure there's just some general advice that you could probably pass on. Do you think there's anything that, you know, could 
makes a positive difference? Yeah, like I'm I'm not really much into the movie industry. I did do the intro music to this cool podcast called Black Fawn Distro's Takeover Tuesday. Um, but uh, yeah we're replacing that next week by the way (laughs) (laughs) shit (laughs) only took us six months to name it so yeah yeah you're gonna keep the name and and get rid of the track um (laughs) (laughs) i think i don't know i think what i would say to uh to young aspiring musicians uh or anybody looking to get into uh the entertainment industry at large is just learn how to hang you know learn how to read a room um if you're being super crass and you're not getting a response, uh, you're probably being too crass. Um, stuff mm. like that. Because, I mean, you can practice your chops day in and day out. And I feel like a lot of musicians particularly are incredible these days. Uh, there's definitely something in the water. Um, but if you can't hang, you're not going to get that gig. And maybe somebody not as good as you will get the gig because they can hang and eventually they'll get the chops. Yeah. I think, um, I think the, the, one of the big differences is that, uh, the movie industry is, is so intimate as far as, as, as far as the art form goes. Right. And all, and all I mean by that is that, you know, when you're in a band and you're in, and I'm sure you can relate to this, like, you know, you're in a band with like three or four or five other people. Um, you know, you get to know those people pretty intimately as far as like traveling around and playing shows, you know, your idiosyncrasies and all that stuff. And I think that happens on a larger scale in a film. Um, but also because of that, I think there's a lot of conflicting personalities. You just have more, it's kind of like, you know, if you were in a band, instead of being in a band with four other dudes, if you were in a band with like eight other dudes and, uh, or, or gals or whatever, and, and just having all like even more personalities to try and sort of put together. And, you know, everyone needs their ego stroked a little bit here and there. And, um, you know, I, I I'm going to gamble and say me and you are not, we're not, uh, we're not removed from that either, but, but I do feel like in movies, it's a little bit more, but I do, but again, like I said, like, I think that's a positive as well. And the positive aspect of that is that I think people really form, uh, strong bonds and friendships that last uh, for years and, and can bleed over from one film project to the next. And, and I think that you see that in big Hollywood movies, um, all the way down to like into into indie films and and that's my personal experience of what i've experienced in uh in southern ontario at least with the with the film community operating out of toronto and surrounding area so hmm, i don't know that's my take (laughs) (laughs) if anyone has anything to add let us know be interesting to hear interested to hear your thoughts um okay so uh look Violence Exposed just came out, just dropped uh, your brand new sing- single from your uh, from your new project, Reciprolog. Of course, uh, anyone who can buy the the um, uh, the uh, uh, the track f- through Bandcamp, and of course, all proceeds are being uh, directed towards the Guelph Black Heritage Society. Uh, so make sure you check it, check out that track. Uh, it's a it's a banging tune. Um, Derek, what can you tell us about uh, what else you have coming up, or what you're working on, and uh, how can people get in touch with you uh, if they if they want to? Yeah, well, I'm working on single number two for Reciprolog uh, with the almighty Sam pa- uh, Sam Patterson of Mandroid Echo Star. And uh, oh, wait, sorry, 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 sorry. I don't mean to jump in there. Correction, mm-hmm. uh, a Juno Award winning. Oh yes, yes. Sam Patterson. <laughs> How could I forget that? If I were him, I'd carry that thing everywhere I went. But um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we uh, we actually just recorded drums and we're uh, in the process of mixing those. And, uh, yeah, I don't really have a release date for that yet, but I promise I will keep you posted on my social media sites, which brings me to social media sites. Um, you can follow me at the walk show on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, I'm also on Facebook just as Derek Prince Cox and Reciprolog is on Facebook and Instagram at Reciprolog, which is, uh, R E C I P R O L O G U E a bit of a mouthful um but what can i say man all the cool names were taken <laughs> uh i'm actually just going to uh throw that up as well so um uh, of course um let me just see here this is our last uh our, our sort of our last ticker that we had up but um uh, i'm just trying to find it here so we can yeah here we go uh 
Yeah, so uh, check out Reciprolog um, on Bandcamp, uh, the new single, The Violence Exposed, featuring Ryan Drury, uh, go, guest vocal spot on the track. Um, but it's a fantastic track, and like I mentioned, all the proceeds are going towards uh, the Guelph Black Heritage Society. Uh, and of course, hey, if you're listening right now and you have a friend that you'd like to send a real rock and tune to, uh, please just email us at takeover at blackfondistribution.com. And what we'll do is we'll send, uh, we'll purchase, we'll make a purchase uh, of The Violence Exposed and send out that track to whomever you want. And we will cover the cost. And of course, that cost going and those proceeds going to Guelph Black Heritage Society. Uh, all right. So I think that's kind of about it, man. I don't, I don't know. Do you want to talk about anything else? You got anything else coming up that people should know about or? Well, I first, I want to say like, thanks for doing that, man. That, that rules hard. Oh, no worries, man. Um, like I said, we, we think it's a good cause too. And, and, you know, I, it's just great to see things come together. Right. I mean, we've been through the music ringer uh, together at at a few points in our lives. And it's like, you know, here, pay a couple bucks, you get a cool track um, and it goes towards supporting something good. Right. And uh, all the power to you, my friend. Uh, I I wish there was more people like you that were doing more projects like this, because I really do feel that like a lot of people could get behind it and, and do some uh, really make a difference as far as like uh, um, uh, a little bit uh, or as, as far as putting out music and, and making sure that it's supporting something good. So, like I said, it just needs to be good and it can potentially do something great. So I got one last question. We got one last question from uh, uh, our audience t- tuning in tonight. And again, thanks for everyone for tuning in. Uh, but from our good friend, d- good friend, Daryl, uh, as I mentioned before, longtime listener of the show, he said, what do you miss most about the shadow? Oh, ah, that's a- certainly, <laughs> certainly not the smell. Uh, and also, I mean, shout out to Orange Hat Film Productions, by the way. Um, yeah. yeah, the shadow, dude, it, it was just a, like, it was a fucking cool bar. You know what I missed the most actually in retrospect was shotgun Saturdays and Bender will know what I'm talking about. Oh man. Uh, <laughs> we, we would basically rent it out and get together and get super drunk and blast Pantera home videos and crank metal. It was, it was awesome. I mean, the shows were incredible too. The scene was incredible. And actually, it's funny you ask, Daryl, because uh, J Cloth is back, um, and he yeah, was nuts. a big part of those shadow shows, man. So it's uh, kind of crazy that you asked that, man. Yeah, I, I would, I would probably say Shock on Saturdays, man. I remember, uh, um, I remember doing the. Uh, we did a surprise birthday for a friend of ours, and uh, and we played. I think it was like every other track we played was Pantera. Or, or like a Pantera side, pro- like, I mean, we played damage plan or something like that. And it wasn't like two, two dollar beers. I think it was like, it was like something crazy like that. Like you could walk into 10 bucks and walk away with like eight beers and, um, or I guess four beers, but, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Well, you're seeing double though. So yeah. yeah. O- hopefully that answers your question, Daryl. Um, it sounds like you've been holding on to that one for a while. So I'm glad we got an answer for you. Um, but, uh, Hey, um, Listen, man, uh, can you stick around just after we go off the air? I just want to kind of catch up a little bit. But uh, uh, for for everyone else out there, thank you for tuning in. And again, big thanks to Derek Prince Cox, host of The Walk Show, and also um, front man or, uh, you know, uh, head honcho of Reciprolog, which is a new band that he's put together and his new singles out now on Bandcamp called The Violence Exposed. Of course, if you're tuning in live on Facebook, Twitch, Twitter, and YouTube, we do appreciate you for sure. And thanks for tuning in every other Tuesday for Black Von Distro's Takeover Tuesday. Of course, if you're not tuning in live, we also ran- retransmit to all the major streaming platforms, including Apple and Spotify and wherever else you, you pick up your favorite podcasts. Um, remember to like, follow, share, and subscribe on whatever platform you're listening to. Uh, we definitely appreciate the support. And of course, uh, as I mentioned off the top of the show, it doesn't just support us, but it also supports um, our awesome guests and the cool projects that they're working on as well. So thank you very much. Um, until next time, uh, I guess, uh, I don't know, any any last words, Walk, that you'd like to add? Uh, thank you so much for having me. And to the viewers, thank you so much for chiming in. Um, I'm uh, I'm just super appreciative, man. I'm just, I'm, I promised myself I wouldn't cry. <laughs> <laughs> awesome man well listen if you're done checking this show out awesome go check out the walk show it's available on all the platforms i just mentioned and uh it's a great interview series with a lot of talented individuals that are way more talented than me and they've got a lot of cool uh, uh songs and tracks and albums for you to check out as well so again thanks a lot derek i appreciate it and uh yeah we'll talk to you soon thank you
And that does it for another episode of Black Font Distro's Takeover Tuesday. Thanks for tuning in. If you enjoyed tonight's episode, please remember to like, follow, share, and subscribe, and help us spread the word about the program and our incredible guests. If you're interested in grabbing some more information about Black Font Distribution, or want to check out our film titles and merchandise, you can find us online at blackfontdistribution.com. We'd also like to thank our sponsors, Wellington Breweries Hellas Lager, Deadly Grounds Coffee, Twisted Teas, and of course, Black Font Distribution. Just a reminder, you can always catch Black Font Distro's Takeover Tuesday live on Facebook, YouTube, and our other social media platforms. Or pick up one of our retransmissions on any of the major streaming platforms. Until next time, I'm your host, Benner, from Black Font Distro, and we'll see you soon.